Coase Malan is a professor in law at Pretoria University. He teaches in constitutional law, and his main areas of interest are constitutional theory, democracy, and minority questions, topics that are highly relevant for South Africa today. You see, South Africa is a very artificial creation. Yeah. Uh, the the Bura, which is uh, still a, a synonym for the Afrikaners, but which was more a word that was used towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and so on. The Bura that were organized in the two uh, independent Afrikaner or Bura republics towards the end of the 19th century uh, did not want something like South Africa. The main reason for the Anglo Boer War, in a sense, in a certain sense, was that the, uh, the two independent Afrikaner republics resisted the notion of a single unitary South Africa, which British imperialism sought to impose upon uh, the South African territory at that stage. After the Anglo Boer War, <coughs> the policy of the then British government was to bring in as many as possible British immigrants to South Africa in order to Anglicize South Africa. Uh, so, and, and in that way to give further expression to the imperialist uh, objective of creating a true British-like, English-like South African state. That immigration policy, policy then uh, failed. One of the reasons for its failure was that the uh, Liberal Party, uh, the British Liberal P Party came to power in 1906 in, in Britain and they changed the policy completely. They were much more pro-Boer and so on than the previous, than, than, than the Tories who were in power during the Anglo-Boer War and immediately afterwards. So when Union was then formed, when South African Union was formed in 1910, the Boer leaders, mainly President Stein, who used to be the President of the Free State, and General Herzog, who also hailed from the Free State and who later on in 1924 became the, the uh, Prime Minister of South Africa in his capacity as leader of the National Party, which was an Afrikaner Nationalist Party, uh, they actually changed tack and instead of pursuing something like a federal state, they pursued uh, a, a unitary state, yeah. knowing that the unitary state would be dominated by Afrikaners on two conditions. Firstly, that they had to write in the <coughs> constitution, the first South African constitution, which came into force in 1910, they had to write in two things there. Firstly, um, <coughs> equal treatment for Afrikaans and English, at that stage actually Dutch and English, later on yeah. it was changed to Afrikaans, equal treatment, and secondly, that uh, the state should, should be based upon the racial principle, in other words, black people should by and large not partic participate in the state. Uh, it, that was also the basis for Herzog pursuing a policy of territorial separate development, which led to the passing of legislation in 1913 and in 1936 with the view of actually, to put it very bluntly, balkanize South Africa yeah. so that you could have a white, dominated, a white state dominated by Afrikaners on the one hand, in contrast then to a uh, 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 a large number of smaller states for each of the ethnic groups. That so so one could put it shortly that uh, the Afrikaner people found themselves in a situation that they originally didn't want to be in at e all. Exactly. And tried to solve it yes. by this yes. homeland policies yeah, yeah. of the apartheid system. Exactly. exactly. This is precisely what happened. The fault made by the Afrikaner nationalists were twofold, twofold, and that I say as an Afrikaner who must also be able to criticize our own people. They made a fault in the sense, made a great mistake in the sense that they completely underestimated the population uh, growth among, among black people, uh, <coughs> as a result of which much little, much too little land was actually set aside for the various black groups. That was the first mistake. The second mistake is that Afrikaners, and that sounds very presumptuous, but the history, one can consult the historical record. Afrikaners uh, made a huge success as state builders of the South African state. The public service, the military, the police, uh, the way in which the economy was being dealt with. For example, why the National Party after 1948, when the National Party came to power in 1948 and afterwards, 
way in which the Afrikaners built the South African state was a huge success. But that success was self-defeating in the sense that Afrikaners came to believe, well, this, this state is going to be there forever, not realizing that the basis of the state was crumbling in the sense that the, uh, that the white portion of the population was, was shrinking as a result of the fact that a huge number of black people were taken up in the South African economy uh, in the first place and that the numbers of black people grew to such an extent that eventually the, the white state, so to say, couldn't, couldn't maintain itself. That's actually an quite an interesting point because the perception of apartheid was that uh, you were like pressing down the black um, population so hard, but they were still growing in numbers. Yeah, uh, in terms of uh, current, uh, uh, the, the current mostly uh, left-wing pro ANC political discourse in South Africa, uh, that is something that should not be acknowledged. However, we cannot uh, we cannot pretend as if the facts are not known, uh, are, are not there. The, uh, the the population growth among uh, black people in South Africa uh, during the 20th century was enormous, uh, and that was to a fairly large extent, amongst amongst other things, ascribed to um, medical uh, medical help, medical assistance that was given, hospitals that was that were built a lot of social services that were given and so on and so forth. Look, there's no question that uh, white people were treated better than black people under the uh, National Party. However, if one compares the position, and that is what is so unpopular, but it is a fact, if one compares the position of black people in South Africa to black people north of the Limpopo, that is in other uh, sub-Saharan African, African countries, the position of black people in South Africa was much better under the National Party, under, under white government, than in the rest of Africa. That's a fact. So what was the major change in the constitution of the 94? There are two answers to that question. <coughs> the first is a constitutional answer and the next is a political answer. Now, Even though I am uh, a constitutional jurist, I think the most important change is a political change, not the constitutional change. The constitutional change was that the fundamental principle upon which South African constitutional law was based up to 1994 was <coughs> the principle of parliamentary sovereignty that held sway in, uh, in Britain, in England, where parliament is sovereign up to this day. South African constitutional law was largely based upon that principle, parliamentary sovereignty. So in other words, the constitution wasn't a higher law in terms of which lesser laws, normal legislation had to be changed in order to measure the validity or otherwise of it. So that changed in that South Africa adopted in 1994 a constitution which is a kind of an American-like or a, a German-like constitution where the constitution is a so-called higher law. Uh, also, and that is very important, containing a Bill of Rights, and all laws, all legislation, and all governmental conduct has to ha have to be measured against the, 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 the provisions in the Constitution, and to the extent that it is not in line with the Constitution, it can be ruled invalid by the Constitutional Court, also something, uh, well, and also by other courts, also something that wasn't possible under the British-like parliamentary Westminster system. So, so the American Constitution is basically their existence is to restrict the state. Yes. yes. And uh, does this Constitution fill the same purpose here in uh, South Africa? Let, let, let me just let me just say the uh, say what the yeah. other main main change is, which is a political change, which act which is actually the main change that took yes. place. Uh, before 1994, <coughs> South Africa was actually regarded as uh, a divided state in that under the policies of the National Party there would have been uh, separate paths to be followed by the various black groups in order eventually to accomplish uh, independence. What happened in 1994 is that instead of white minority rule, black minority rule, it, that yeah. white minority rule was replaced for black minority rule. That is yeah. fundamentally what has happened. And that, that's the main change. Uh, even though it was said, look, uh, it would not be a case that uh, white minority rule would be replaced, would be, would, would be uh, taken away. 
and that black minority rule would uh, be accomplished in, in the place of that, that it would simply be a, st uh, a state of equality. That was actually that is actually not true. That's romanticizing the position. Pre prior to 1994, South Africa was a white minority dominated state. Now it's a black minority dominated state. Yeah, but uh, the constitution should make sure that the state is ruled by law. And if that works, what does it really matter which demographic group that are in power? Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, the South African constitution, uh, judging by the various provisions and some of the most provisions uh, that it uh, contains, uh, is a constitution that uh, purports to provide sufficient protection for everyone inclusive of the minorities. Because it is said uh, two things, mainly it's uh, well, three things. Firstly, the constitution cannot be changed easily. It requires a two-thirds majority in order to be changed, well, to be amended. So in other words, one can rest assured what you have in the constitution now will be there uh, uh, in times to come. That's the first thing. The second, uh, the second measure of protection is checks and balances, and specifically uh, that the courts have the power, the jurisdiction, the courts as independent and impartial institutions have the power to uh, test all governmental actions inclusive of legislation against the constitution and rule it unconstitutional and invalid to the extent that it not, does not measure up with the, with the constitution. And then thirdly, there's a bill of rights, a bill of individual rights that, uh, that seek to and that uh, pretend to uh, protect the rights of everybody equally. That, however, is also uh, a romanticized view of the South African Constitution. Why do I say so? Well, I think basically for two reasons. In the first place, <coughs> um, even though the South African courts and also courts in other countries, even though the courts are described as independent and impartial. That independence and impartiality should be uh, seen in a proper realistic light. The South African courts are impartial and independent in the sense that members of parliament cannot be members of the court. Members of the executive can also, can also not sit as judges. And that's the first thing. And secondly, they do different things. Parliament adopts legislation, the executive executes them, and the court adjudicates cases. How it, but that is where independence and impartiality stops. In the normal course of events, and this is specifically also true in regard to the South African situation, all three branches of government, inclusive of the courts, are an integral part of the same dominant elite same dominant elite. As a matter of fact, one can see, one can look upon the courts, inclusive of the constitutional court, as an institution that legitimizes and in that uh, sense protects and promotes the ideological aims, the ideological commitments of government in the legislature and in the executive. So you don't really have that balance? Not really, not really. In, in, in words, it seems to be there. But when, it, when push comes to shove, for example, whenever a case uh, that, re, that, uh, that challenges some of the fundamental um, assumptions of the current uh, ideological policy of the ANC, which is termed the policy of transformation, or in very typical communist um, uh, terminology, the National Democratic Revolution. Whenever anything of that is challenged and reaches the court, you can be certain that the Constitutional Court would give judgment against the challenger and in favour of government. I can quickly, I, I wrote about this topic, yeah. I can mention at least five cases, very prominent cases, leading cases in the past five, six years, in which the Constitutional Court uh, uh, <coughs> time and again, or to my mind, almost predictably, pre predictably gave judgment against the challenges of aspects of such policy. So uh, would it be wrong to say that the uh, South African state is more ideological driven rather than driven by the rule of law? Uh, 
Uh, I think that is absolutely correct to say so, yeah. Because uh, I want to have a follow-up question yeah. on that, and that is we have, we have just seen quite a drastic change in the South African constitution, or a change to be, yeah. and that is the land question, the yeah. land expropriation without yeah. compensation. Okay, uh, we, we, should, we should address the question of, of, of constitutional theory in this case. <coughs> you see, what, what happens is that uh, in normal liberal political theory, and also in normal constitutional theory, and very often the two are almost the same, yeah. constitutional theory and political theory, they are, they are running concurrently. <coughs> now, in the trite liberal constitutional and, and political theory, it is said, well, the constitution can only change when it is formally amended, when the text is amended. That is, that is what is normally accepted. That is actually wrong. That is not so. Yeah. A constitution also changes in two other ways. Firstly, through interpretation by the courts, in terms of which uh, a meaning is ascribed to provisions in the constitution, which is completely in line, and as, as I've said, I can mention a number of such cases, <coughs> in line with the ideological assumptions of the ruling party. That's the first thing. And then secondly, very often, you also found the phenomenon, find the phenomenon of political realities that are simply so overwhelming that it simply marginalizes um, uh, uh, the, uh, the constitution and bring about a new reality which establish a new reality which is next to the constitution but which actually becomes the new constitution in the sense that such new realities are consistently followed, very often followed by people who believe that this is actually the legal position. Just one example. In uh, the South African constitution, you would never find, you never find the word represent, rep representation or representivity in that. However, the policy of representivity has become a new constitutional principle. What does it mean? It means that in each and every organized sphere in society, ANC policy requires that the national population profile should be reflected in the composition of such organized spheres, of all such organized spheres, with the effect that all organized spheres will be black dominated, will be black and black dominated. This is a constitutional mm -hmm. change that has taken place. Uh, over the past couple of years as a result of the socio-political reality of ANC policy that has sim simply permeated through South African society and has actually created a kind of a new constitution. So you, you actually have a practical law in exactly. the real world and uh, another one that you can show the international community to like see. Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. You see, one can actually give it a name. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> normally, in, in, in tried liberal constitutional law, you would simply speak of a law that is amended. So in other words, amended law would always be reflected in new things that are in writing. Yeah. But this is, this is not a realistic way to see a constitution. <clears throat> and this is not only my view. Uh, very interesting research has been done on that uh, in the United States constitutional setup, in Belgium, in Germany, and so on and so forth. Precisely the same thing is also happening in South Africa, where the law, in order, in order to detect, in order to establish what the law, law really entails, very often you shouldn't ask the lawyers, you should actually ask political scientists and people who are sharp um, uh, <coughs> uh, observers of politics. New practices, they would indicate to you, will establish themselves so strongly that that actually constituted constitute new constitutional law. So the existing constitutional law is simply substituted or it simply laps, lapses as a result of new practices that come in place. Uh, that's a very interesting put because uh, that makes me immediately think about uh, the state of Urania yeah. that is being run by Karl Bosov because yeah. he literally said the same thing that what we're trying to do to strive for self-determination yeah. is to live it and then the law will follow. <coughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think the, the question is an appropriate question and I think it, 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 it fits into what we're discussing here. Uh, just a little bit of background, if I may. Uh, you see, many changes have taken place in the South African constitutional setup. Um, 
I can also mention the language question. South Africa has 11 languages, so the Constitution says. Yeah. 11 official languages. That, however, is simply not true. If one wants to use harsh words, you can say the Constitution lies. What has happened is that English has become, for all practical purposes, a sole language, sole official language in South Africa. And there are many other examples I can use. Perhaps one that would interest you is this. Yeah. In terms of the Constitution, uh, <coughs> there is one police force, one army, and so on and so forth, and specifically one police force who has to look after the interests of uh, South African citizenry, look after the um, uh, public safety, and so on and so forth. That is no longer true. In South Africa, we have 150,000 policemen, uh, <coughs> in the police force, the police services that is called, but you have something like almost, you have around about 9,000 um, private security organizations and in the vicinity of 450 to 480,000 uh, private security uh, officers. Apart from, if you drive through South Africa, this suburb which we are in here now, you'll see that there are two security yeah. Uh, vehicles moving up and down. I'm one of the people who pay for that together with folks living in this area. What has actually happened is that a constitutional change has taken place in that South African, the South African public has taken over that uh, responsibility for, for private safety, which government, for a variety of reasons, uh, is not capable or interested in doing. Yeah, I actually seen it as an observer, see that in other aspects in your country as well, yeah. that people are paying double for almost everything. Yes. You pay taxes for the health care, but still you have a private health yes. insurance. You yes. pay money for the police, but you still you have a yeah. private security exactly. of your facilities. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I got one question before, we, maybe we can talk a little bit more about Aronia. But uh, this constitutional change that we see now yeah. take place in yes. your country, yes. what would have happened if the ANC were to put, try to put them in place in '94 when they first seized power? Um, <coughs> it would not have been possible for that to happen at that stage because the political force, the social political forces who would resist that would still be strong enough to actually be uh, capable of resisting that. So what has happened is the power balance between the Afrikaner and the yes. black community has changed. Has changed, but, but this, the, when, when it comes to, to certain other matters, such as this whole question that we've just touched on, uh, on uh, uh, private security, in that regard, the change that has taken place in that the public is taking over that particular responsibility is not because of the ANC or the government's strength, it's because of the weakness. Yeah. Okay. So in other words, some of the constitutional changes that are taking place in South Africa by stealth is not so much ascribed to the ANC's strength, but pre precisely the opposite, their weakness. Uh, this is uh, a consequence <coughs> of something very uh, odd and s at the same time very interesting that you find in South Africa. The ANC has a number of totalitarian objectives. They want to, uh, to regulate all aspects of South African society. But at the same time, uh, they also follow the policy, pursue the policy of so-called uh, Cadre deployment, perhaps you might have heard about that. In terms of cadre deployment, uh, <coughs> it is argued that each and every aspect of South African society, and that has been spelled out in ANC uh, policy documents on numerous occasions. They were, are very open about that. Each and every aspect of South African society, including the public service, the army, the police, the courts, uh, the private sector and so on and so forth. They want to appoint their own people and this has been happening. Uh, the ANC has been criticized for that in various occasions but Gwede Montash, uh, the, pre the, the current uh, chair of the ANC uh, and the previous, who is also the, the, the previous um, secretary general of the ANC, has said on several occasions, no, we are committed to that policy, we will pursue it regardless of the, of the uh, criticism that might be leveled against that. Now, if you appoint your own people, very often those people might be very loyal cadres, yeah. but they are very poor public servants. Okay, so there's uh, an anomaly, uh, a, a contradiction. You want to achieve a totalitarian state, but in order to achieve that, you must have competent public servants. So no, they don't have the competent public servants, as a result of which the fact that you see that uh, public security through the uh, incompetent police 
uh, people that are not properly trained and so on, uh, people, the police that does, that does not have sufficient vehicles and so on and so forth, is simply not taking place. So a vacuum uh, opens up, yeah. and that vacuum is simply filled by uh, yeah, the by, private by the, sphere. By, by, the, by, the, by the private sphere. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And uh, do you think that private sphere will be a window of opportunity for some fundamental change to this country? I think so. I think it's already taking place. I think it's already take, already taking place. There's a there's a there's an old principle. Uh, <clears throat> I think one can almost accept it as a as a as a trite principle, and that is that vacuums are filled. Vacuums are filled. Uh, it is very bad if you have a faltering state. South Africa is not a failed state, not, not at all, but in very many respects, it's a faltering state, yeah. uh, which leaves gaps to be opened, and that gaps are simply filled. Yeah. And those gaps. Are yeah, open. and that leads me to, to my final question. Yes. That's the question of uh, self determination for, uh, for Afrikaner groups. Yeah. What, uh, Urania would be one example of those, but uh, within this cur current system, uh, is there any room within the law to actually? claim self-determination? Uh, okay, once again we have to distinguish between the constitution in written form in contrast to the actual constitution. I, I think our from our conversation thus yeah, far... Yeah, the I understand where, yeah. 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 Now, there is a provision in South African constitution section 235, which is a much spoken of provision. Uh, let me not go into the uh, into the details of that provision, but if one peruse it and if you analyze it, you'll soon see that it doesn't really provide for self-determination. It says that Parliament can adopt legislation that may provide for self-determination. Parliament is dominated by the ANC, so that's never going to happen, right? So that's the formal position. But the informal position. <coughs> which brings us to the, uh, to the, the sphere of the actual constitution. Uh, if one focuses upon that, then you'll see, well, there are actually many uh, gaps opening up where people simply start with, um, very, often, very often because they don't have a choice but to do that, with, uh, with certain actions, and that such actions, such conduct, such programs are actually programs of limited and increased self-determination. And I think that it's been happening in Urania is actually an example of that. I should actually also mention that even though that is not so well known, I think this is also take this is also taking place in a variety of other communities, not only uh, Afrikaner communities, but specifically also black communities all through South Africa. As the state is is uh, is uh, retreating, uh, people are simply taking over responsibility to look after themselves in uh, through forms of self-determination which uh, to my mind is is happening to an increased extent yeah so so one could uh, quite blunt say that the strive for self-determination is regardless of what is e written in the law exactly exactly yeah. the uh, the uh, the trite um, uh, assumption of the rule of law is that <coughs> the facts follow the law. You must first have a particular legal position provided for in legislation in the constitution and then thereafter the facts will follow in conformity, uh, in keeping with what is stated in law. In constitutional law, especially in a, in a, in a fast changing, in a rapidly changing society such as ours, that is often the opposite. That yeah. you first get facts that change regardless of what the legal position might be and then possibly later on, the, the formal law might be changed in order to recognize what has already happened previously. Yeah, so the law is just a formalization of our behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A formali it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a definition of what has happened yesterday. And uh, just one final uh, question. What's your uh, take on the near future of South Africa? Um, the Multis. Yes, in the first place, I think it's going to be a tumultuous uh, era. Uh, I think that we are confronted with a government who has many problems and who is at the same time a very irresponsible government. Uh, I see that there are some of the mainstream uh, United States media and also some of the other media, British media and European media, who are increasingly compare South Africa, the South African government,
and the policies that the South African government seek to pursue with that of Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Unfortunately, I think they are, uh, they, they, that there is much validity in that observation. I think, however, that the South African, um, that the South African um, uh, public, the various uh, aspects of the South African public, including the Afrikaner part of the South African public, is well organized and increasingly well organized. Uh, and for that reason, I do not think that we will go down the same way down the drain as Zimbabwe and Venezuela, but not because of government, but because of these uh, civil institutions in civil society who are effectively organizing themselves, hopefully increasingly with the help and the assistance, to what extent that might be possible, uh, of um, friends, governments, the media and so on overseas in Europe, United States and Britain. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to hear that was a uh, nice conversation. Thank you.